All right, folks, welcome back. So we're continuing on with the Mars mystery. As always, disclaimer, under Section 107 of the Copyright Act, 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. So we're continuing on with the mystery of Cydonia, Close Encounter. This is part two. Rocketing technology. So Robert Hutchings Goddard built the precursor to modern space rockets in 1926 with a small prototype that only reached a height of 60 meters before crashing. This prototype proved that rockets could, at least theoretically, be used to leave the Earth and go to other planets. During the Second World War, the Nazis first developed their V-1 and V-2 rockets, greatly improving on Goddard's initial design. And there you see uh, the images there. The visual aids help so much. The space race. Hancock makes the point that it was the Cold War that kicked the advances in rocket technology into high gear. In both the Soviet Union and the West, government resources went into massively improving rocket propulsion technology for their nuclear missile programs. An offshoot of this led to Russia developing the Sputnik 1 in 1957, which triggered the space race. In 1958, NASA was founded, and shortly thereafter, the US sent their first satellite into space, the Explorer 1. Russia sent the first man into space, Yuri Gagarin, in 1961. President Kennedy committed NASA to putting a man on the moon by the end of the decade, and this promise was apparently fulfilled in 1969. I say apparently because there's all kinds of conspiracy theories about that, but that's subject for another time. Hancock points out that all this was fueled by the Cold War and the military-industrial complex. American success. So the Soviets sent their first probe to Mars in 1962, although contact was lost just short of the Red Planet. The Mariner 4 was launched by NASA in 1964. It got within 10,000 kilometers of Mars and sent back 21 pictures. This was the first close look we got at Mars and it quickly dispelled a few long-held fantastical notions about canals and an advanced civilization. Wasteland. So following the success of the Mariner 4, the Mariner 6 and 7 probes were launched in 1969, sending back over 200 new photographs. Early Mars missions were plagued with glitches and technical failures, and were soon overshadowed by the more high-profile moon missions. Mars had turned out to be little more than a barren, lifeless rock full of impact craters. The Mariner probes also put to rest the notion that Mars' atmosphere was composed of nitrogen, but rather carbon dioxide, and it had a far lower surface pressure than had been anticipated. However, Hancock asserts that NASA was almost too quick to write off the Red Planet entirely, as over the next decade, interesting new discoveries would in fact be made. And on that note, Thank you very much for watching. Feel free to leave your thoughts and comments below. It's just getting good now. Once I get into uh, <laughs> the further presentations, of course, we'll elaborate on that with, you know, the Valley Madineris and Olympus Mons. And there's loads of things about Mars that's very, very interesting indeed, if you uh, really look at it. You know, but initially, of course, they're, th they're sending up these probes thinking they're going to see canals, they're going to see this advanced civilization. And, you know, at first glance, it just looks like this dead, barren rock that's just sitting there rather impotently. But one of my mottos in life is, look again, you know. And when NASA looked again, as Hancock will point out in the future presentations, they really, uh, they really were almost too quick to just dismiss Mars entirely. There are things about Mars which are very, very interesting. We'll get into that in the future. Don't want to say too much just now. Don't want to spoil it. Anyway, as always, leave your thoughts and comments down below. See you next time. Why are my teeth showing like that?